Nero, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Nero, Part One. Paragraphs 1 to 18. Two celebrated families, the Calvini and Ahenobarbi, sprung from the race of the Domitii. The Ahenobarbi derive both their extraction and their cognomen from one Lucius Domitius, of whom we have this tradition. As he was returning out of the country to Rome, he was met by two young men of a most august appearance, who desired him to announce to the Senate and people a victory of which no certain intelligence had yet reached the city. To prove that they were more than mortals, they stroked his cheeks, and thus changed his hair, which was black, to a bright colour resembling that of brass, which mark of distinction descended to his posterity, for they had generally red beards. This family had the honour of seven consulships, one triumph and two censorships, and being admitted into the patrician order, they continued the use of the same cognomen, with no other prinomina than those of Cneus and Lucius. These, however, they assumed with singular irregularity, three persons in succession sometimes adhering to one of them, and then they were changed alternately. For the first, second, and third of the Hennobarbi had the prinomen of Lucius, and again the three following, successively, that of Cneus, while those who came after were called by turns one Lucius and the other Cneus, it appears to me proper to give a short account of several of the family, to show that Nero so far degenerated from the noble qualities of his ancestors that he retained only their vices, as if those alone had been transmitted to him by his descent. To begin, therefore, at a remote period, his great-grandfather's grandfather, Cnaeus Domitius, when he was tribune of the people, being offended with the high priests for electing another than himself in the room of his father, obtained the transfer of the right of election from the colleges of the priests to the people. In his consulship, having conquered the Allobroges and the Arverni, he made a progress through the province, mounted upon an elephant, with a body of soldiers attending him in a sort of triumphal pomp. Of this person the orator Licinius Crassus said, It was no wonder he had a brazen beard, who had a face of iron and a heart of lead. His son, during his praetorship, proposed that Cnaeus Caesar, upon the expiration of his consulship, should be called to account before the Senate for his administration of that office, which was supposed to be contrary both to the omens and the laws. Afterwards, when he was consul himself, he tried to deprive Cnaeus of the command of the army, and having been by intrigue and cabal appointed his successor, he was made prisoner at Corsinium, in the beginning of the civil war. Being set at liberty, he went to Marseilles, which was then besieged, where, having by his presence animated the people to hold out, he suddenly deserted them, and at last was slain in the Battle of Pharsalia. He was a man of little constancy, and of a sullen temper. In despair of his fortunes, he had recourse to poison, but was so terrified at the thoughts of death, that immediately repenting he took a vomit to throw it up again, and gave freedom to his physician for having with great prudence and wisdom given him only a gentle dose of the poison. When Cnaeus Pompey was consulting with his friends in what manner he should conduct himself towards those who were neuter and took no part in the contest, he was the only one who proposed that they should be treated as enemies. He left a son, who was without doubt the best of the family. By the Pedian law he was condemned, although innocent, amongst others who were concerned in the death of Caesar. Upon this he went over to Brutus and Cassius, his near relations, and after their death not only kept together the fleet, the command of which had been given him some time before, but even increased it. At last, when the party had everywhere been defeated, he voluntarily surrendered it to Mark Antony, considering it as a piece of service for which the latter owed him no small obligations. Of all those who were condemned by the law above mentioned, he was the only man who was restored to his country, and filled the highest offices. When the civil war again broke out, he was appointed lieutenant under the same Antony, 
and offered the chief command by those who were ashamed of Cleopatra. But not daring, on account of a sudden indisposition with which he was seized, either to accept or refuse it, he went over to Augustus, and died a few days later, not without an aspersion cast upon his memory. For Antony gave out that he was induced to change sides by his impatience to be with his mistress, Servilia Nais. This Cnaeus had a son, named Domitius, who was afterwards well known as the nominal purchaser of the family property left by Augustus's will, and no less famous in his youth for his dexterity in chariot-driving than he was afterwards for the triumphal ornaments which he obtained in the German war. But he was a man of great arrogance, prodigality, and cruelty. When he was aedile he obliged Lucius Plancus, the censor, to give him the way, and in his praetorship and consulship he made Roman knights and married women act on the stage. He gave hunts of wild beasts, both in the circus and in all the wards of the city, as also a show of gladiators, but with such barbarity that Augustus, after privately reprimanding him to no purpose, was obliged to restrain him by a public edict. By the elder Antonia he had Nero's father, a man of execrable character in every part of his life. During his attendance upon Caius Caesar in the east, he killed a freedman of his own for refusing to drink as much as he ordered him. Being dismissed for this from Caesar's society, he did not mend his habits, for in a village upon the Appian Road he suddenly whipped his horses and drove his chariot on purpose over a poor boy, crushing him to pieces. At Rome he struck out the eye of a Roman knight in the Forum, only for some free language in a dispute between them. He was likewise so fraudulent that he not only cheated some silversmiths of the price of goods he had bought of them, but, during his praetorship, defrauded the owners of chariots in the Circensian games of the prizes due to them for their victory. His sister jeering him for the complaints made by the leaders of the several parties, he agreed to sanction a law that, for the future, the prizes should be immediately paid. A little before the death of Tiberius, he was prosecuted for treason, adulteries, and incest with his sister Lepida, but escaped in the timely change of affairs, and died of a dropsy at Pyrgi, leaving behind him his son Nero, whom he had by Agrippina, the daughter of Germanicus. Nero was born at Antium, nine months after the death of Tiberius, upon the 18th of the calends of January, 15th of December, just as the sun rose, so that its beams touched him before they could well reach the earth. While many fearful conjectures, in respect to his future fortune, were formed by different persons from the circumstances of his nativity, a saying of his father Domitius was regarded as an ill presage, who told his friends, who were congratulating him upon the occasion, that nothing but what was detestable and pernicious to the public could ever be produced of him and Agrippina. Another manifest prognostic of his future infelicity occurred upon his lustration day, for Caius Caesar being requested by his sister to give the child what name he thought proper, looking at his uncle Claudius, who afterwards when emperor adopted Nero, he gave his, and this not seriously but only in jest, Agrippina treating it with contempt because Claudius at that time was a mere laughing-stock at the palace. He lost his father when he was three years old, being left heir to a third part of his estate, of which he never got possession, the whole being seized by his co-heir Caius. His mother being soon after banished, he lived with his aunt Lepida, in a very necessitous condition, under the care of two tutors, a dancing-master and a barber. After Claudius came to the empire, he not only recovered his father's estate, but was enriched by the additional inheritance of that of his stepfather, Crispus Passienus. Upon his mother's recall from banishment, he was advanced to such favour, through Nero's powerful interest with the emperor, that it was reported assassins were employed by Messalina, Claudius's wife, to strangle him as Britannicus's rival, whilst he was taking his noonday repose. In addition to the story, it was said that they were frightened by a serpent, which crept from under his cushion, and ran away. The tale was occasioned by finding on his couch, near the pillow, the skin of a snake, which, by his mother's order, he wore for some time upon his right arm, enclosed in a bracelet of gold. 
This amulet at last he laid aside, from aversion to her memory, but he sought for it again in vain at the time of his extremity. When he was yet a mere boy, before he arrived at the age of puberty, during the celebration of the Circensian Games he performed his part in the Trojan play with a degree of firmness which gained him great applause. In the eleventh year of his age he was adopted by Claudius, and placed under the tuition of Aeneas Seneca, who had been made a senator. It is said that Seneca dreamt the night after that he was giving a lesson to Caius Caesar. Nero soon verified his dream, betraying the cruelty of his disposition in every way he could. For he attempted to persuade his father that his brother, Britannicus, was nothing but a changeling, because the latter had saluted him, notwithstanding his adoption, by the name of Aenobarbus, as usual. When his aunt Lepida was brought to trial, he appeared in court as a witness against her, to gratify his mother, who persecuted the accused. On his introduction to the forum, at the age of manhood, he gave a largesse to the people, and a donative to the soldiers. For the Praetorian cohorts he appointed a solemn procession under arms, and marched at the head of them, with a shield in his hand, after which he went to return thanks to his father in the Senate. Before Claudius, likewise, at the time he was consul, he made a speech for the Bolognese in Latin, and for the Rhodians and people of Ilium in Greek. He had the jurisdiction of prefect of the city for the first time during the Latin festival, during which the most celebrated advocates brought before him not short and trifling causes, as is usual in that case, but trials of importance, notwithstanding they had instructions from Claudius himself to the contrary. Soon afterwards he married Octavia, and exhibited the Circensian games and hunting of wild beasts in honour of Claudius. He was seventeen years of age at the death of that prince, and as soon as that event was made public, he went out to the cohort on guard between the hours of six and seven, for the omens were so disastrous that no earlier time of the day was judged proper. On the steps before the palace gate he was unanimously saluted by the soldiers as their emperor, and then carried in a litter to the camp, thence, after making a short speech to the troops, into the senate-house, where he continued until the evening, of all the immense honours which were heaped upon him, refusing none but the title of father of his country, on account of his youth. He began his reign with an ostentation of dutiful regard to the memory of Claudius, whom he buried with the utmost pomp and magnificence, pronouncing the funeral oration himself, and then had him enrolled amongst the gods. He paid likewise the highest honours to the memory of his father Domitius. He left the management of affairs, both public and private, to his mother. The word which he gave the first day of his reign to the tribune on guard was the best of mothers, and afterwards he frequently appeared with her in the streets of Rome in her litter. He settled a colony at Antium, in which he placed the veteran soldiers belonging to the guards, and obliged several of the richest centurions of the first rank to transfer their residence to that place, where he likewise made a noble harbour at a prodigious expense. To establish still further his character, he declared that he designed to govern according to the model of Augustus, and omitted no opportunity of showing his generosity, clemency, and complacence. The more burthensome taxes he either entirely took off or diminished, the rewards appointed for informers by the Papian law he reduced to a fourth part, and distributed to the people four hundred sesterces a man. To the noblest of the senators, who were much reduced in their circumstances, he granted annual allowances, in some cases as much as five hundred thousand sesterces, and to the praetorian cohorts a monthly allowance of corn gratis. When called upon to subscribe the sentence, according to custom, of a criminal condemned to die, I wish, said he, I had never learnt to read and write. He continually saluted people of the several orders by name without a prompter. When the Senate returned him their thanks for his good government, he replied to them, It will be time enough to do so when I shall have deserved it. He admitted the common people to see him perform his exercises in the Campus Martius. He frequently declaimed in public, and recited verses of his own composing, not only at home, but in the theatre, 
so much to the joy of all the people that public prayers were appointed to be put up to the gods upon that account, and the verses which he had publicly read were, after being written in gold letters, consecrated to Jupiter Capitolinus. He presented the people with a great number and variety of spectacles, as the juvenile and Circensian games, stage plays, and an exhibition of gladiators. In the juvenile he even admitted senators and aged matrons to perform parts. In the Circensian games he assigned the equestrian order seats apart from the rest of the people, and had races performed by chariots drawn each by four camels. In the games which he instituted for the eternal duration of the empire, and therefore ordered to be called Maximi, many of the senatorian and equestrian order of both sexes performed. A distinguished Roman knight descended on the stage by a rope mounted on an elephant. A Roman play, likewise, composed by Afranius, was brought upon the stage. It was entitled The Fire, and in it the performers were allowed to carry off and to keep to themselves the furniture of the house which, as the plot of the play required, was burnt down in the theatre. Every day during the solemnity many thousand articles of all descriptions were thrown amongst the people to scramble for, such as fowls of different kinds, tickets for corn, clothes, gold, silver, gems, pearls, pictures, slaves, beasts of burden, wild beasts that had been tamed, at last ships, lots of houses and lands were offered as prizes in a lottery. These games he beheld from the front of the proscenium. In the show of gladiators, which he exhibited in a wooden amphitheatre, built within a year in the district of the Campus Martius, he ordered that none should be slain, not even the condemned criminals employed in the combats. He secured four hundred senators and six hundred Roman knights, amongst whom were some of unbroken fortunes and unblemished reputation, to act as gladiators. From the same orders he engaged persons to encounter wild beasts, and for various other services in the theatre. He presented the public with the representation of a naval fight upon sea-water, with huge fishes swimming in it, as also with the pyrrhic dance performed by certain youths, to each of whom, after the performance was over, he granted the freedom of Rome. During this diversion a bull covered pacify, concealed within a wooden statue of a cow, as many of the spectators believed. Icarus, upon his first attempt to fly, fell on the stage, close to the emperor's pavilion, and bespattered him with blood. For he very seldom presided in the games, but used to view them reclining on a couch, at first through some narrow apertures, but afterwards with the podium quite open. He was the first who instituted, in imitation of the Greeks, a trial of skill in the three several exercises of music, wrestling, and horse-racing, to be performed at Rome every five years, and which he called Neronia. Upon the dedication of his bath and gymnasium, he furnished the senate and the equestrian order with oil. He appointed as judges of the trial men of consular rank, chosen by lot, who sat with the praetors. At this time he went down into the orchestra amongst the senators, and received the crown for the best performance in Latin prose and verse, for which several persons of the greatest merit contended, but they unanimously yielded to him. The crown for the best performer on the harp being likewise awarded to him by the judges, he devoutly saluted it, and ordered it to be carried to the statue of Augustus. In the gymnastic exercises, which he presented in the sceptre, while they were preparing the great sacrifice of an ox, he shaved his beard for the first time, and, putting it up in a casket of gold studded with pearls of great price, consecrated it to Jupiter Capitolinus. He invited the Vestal Virgins to see the wrestlers perform, because at Olympia the priestesses of Ceres are allowed the privilege of witnessing that exhibition. Amongst the spectacles presented by him, the solemn entrance of Tiridates into the city deserves to be mentioned. This personage, who was king of Armenia, he invited to Rome by very liberal promises. But being prevented by unfavourable weather from showing him to the people upon the day fixed by proclamation, he took the first opportunity which occurred, several cohorts being drawn up under arms about the temples in the forum, while he was seated on a curule chair on the rostra, in a triumphal dress, amidst the military standards and ensigns. Upon Tiridates advancing towards him, 
on a stage made shelving for the purpose, he permitted him to throw himself at his feet, but quickly raised him with his right hand and kissed him. The emperor then, at the king's request, took the turban from his head and replaced it by a crown, whilst a person of praetorian rank proclaimed in Latin the words in which the prince addressed the emperor as a suppliant. After this ceremony the king was conducted to the theatre, where, after renewing his obeisance, Nero seated him on his right hand. Being then greeted by universal acclamation with the title of emperor, and sending his laurel crown to the capital, Nero shut the temple of the two-faced Janus, as though there now existed no war throughout the Roman Empire. He filled the consulship four times, the first for two months, the second and last for six, and the third for four. The two intermediate ones he held successively, but the others after an interval of some years between them. In the administration of justice he scarcely ever gave his decision on the pleadings before the next day, and then in writing. His manner of hearing causes was not to allow any adjournment, but to dispatch them in order as they stood. When he withdrew to consult his assessors, he did not debate the matter openly with them, but silently and privately reading over their opinions, which they gave separately in writing, he pronounced sentence from the tribunal according to his own view of the case, as if it was the opinion of the majority. For a long time he would not admit the sons of freedmen into the Senate, and those who had been admitted by former princes he excluded from all public offices. To supernumerary candidates he gave command in the legions, to comfort them under the delay of their hopes. The consulship he commonly conferred for six months, and one of the two consuls dying a little before the 1st of January, he substituted no one in his place, disliking what had been formerly done for Caninius Rebilus on such an occasion, who was consul for one day only. He allowed the triumphal honours only to those who were of quaestorian rank, and to some of the equestrian order, and bestowed them without regard to military service. And instead of the quaestors, whose office it properly was, he frequently ordered that the addresses which he sent to the Senate on certain occasions should be read by the consuls. He devised a new style of building in the city, ordering piazzas to be erected before all houses, both in the streets and detached, to give facilities from their terraces, in case of fire, for preventing it from spreading, and these he built at his own expense. He likewise designed to extend the city walls as far as Ostia, and bring the sea from thence by a canal into the old city. Many severe regulations and new orders were made in his time. A sumptuary law was enacted, public suppers were limited to the sportuli, and victualling houses restrained from selling any dressed victuals except pulse and herbs, whereas before they sold all kinds of meat. He likewise inflicted punishments on the Christians, a sort of people who held a new and impious superstition. He forbade the revels of the charioteers, who had long assumed a license to stroll about, and established for themselves a kind of prescriptive right to cheat and thieve, making a jest of it. The partisans of the rival theatrical performers were banished, as well as the actors themselves. To prevent forgery, a method was then first invented of having writings bored, run through three times with a thread, and then sealed. It was likewise provided that in wills, the two first pages with only the testator's name upon them should be presented blank to those who were to sign them as witnesses, and that no one who wrote a will for another should insert any legacy for himself. It was likewise ordained that clients should pay their advocates a certain reasonable fee, but nothing for the court which was to be gratuitous, the charges for it being paid out of the public treasury, that causes the cognizance of which before belonged to the judges of the exchequer should be transferred to the forum and the ordinary tribunals, and that all appeals from the judges should be made to the senate. He never entertained the least ambition or hope of augmenting and extending the frontiers of the empire. On the contrary, he had thoughts of withdrawing the troops from Britain, and was only restrained from so doing by the fear of appearing to detract from the glory of his father. All that he did was to reduce the kingdom of Pontus, which was ceded to him by Polymon, and also the Alps, upon the death of Cotius, into the form of a province. 
End of Nero Part 1「Nero, Part Two, of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars, by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson, and edited by T. Forrester. Nero, Part Two. Paragraphs 19 to 31. Twice only he undertook any foreign expeditions, one to Alexandria and the other to Achaia, but he abandoned the prosecution of the former on the very day fixed for his departure, by being deterred both by ill omens and the hazard of the voyage. For while he was making the circuit of the temples, having seated himself in that of Vesta, when he attempted to rise, the skirt of his robe stuck fast and he was instantly seized with such a dimness in his eyes that he could not see a yard before him. In Achaia he attempted to make a cut through the isthmus, and having made a speech encouraging his praetorians to set about the work, on a signal given by sound of trumpet, he first broke ground with a spade, and carried off a basket full of earth upon his shoulders. He made preparations for an expedition to the pass of the Caspian Mountains, forming a new legion out of his late levies in Italy, of men all six feet high, which he called the phalanx of Alexander the Great. These transactions, in part unexceptionable and in part highly commendable, I have brought into one view, in order to separate them from the scandalous and criminal part of his conduct, of which I shall now give an account. Among the other liberal arts which he was taught in his youth, he was instructed in music, and immediately after his advancement to the empire, he sent for Terpnus, a performer upon the harp, who flourished at that time with the highest reputation. Sitting with him for several days following, as he sang and played after supper until late at night, he began by degrees to practice upon the instrument himself. Nor did he omit any of those expedients which artists in music adopt for the preservation and improvement of their voices. He would lie upon his back with a sheet of lead upon his breast clear his stomach and bowels by vomits and clisters, and forbear the eating of fruits, or food prejudicial to the voice. Encouraged by his proficiency, though his voice was naturally neither loud nor clear, he was desirous of appearing upon the stage, frequently repeating amongst his friends a Greek proverb to this effect, that no one had any regard for music which they never heard. Accordingly he made his first public appearance at Naples, and although the theatre quivered with the sudden shock of an earthquake, he did not desist until he had finished the piece of music he had begun. He played and sung in the same place several times, and for several days together, taking only now and then a little respite to refresh his voice. Impatient of retirement, it was his custom to go from the bath to the theatre, and after dining in the orchestra, amidst a crowded assembly of the people, he promised them in Greek, that after he had drunk a little, he would give them a tune which would make their ears tingle. Being highly pleased with the songs that were sung in his praise by some Alexandrians belonging to the fleet just arrived at Naples, he sent for more of the like singers from Alexandria. At the same time he chose young men of the equestrian order, and about five thousand robust young fellows from the common people, on purpose to learn various kinds of applause, called bombi, imbriques, and testai, which they were to practice in his favour whenever he performed. They were divided into several parties, and were remarkable for their fine heads of hair, and were extremely well dressed, with rings upon their left hands. The leaders of these bands had salaries of forty thousand sesterces allowed them. At Rome, also, being extremely proud of his singing, he ordered the games called Neronia to be celebrated before the time fixed for their return. All now becoming importunate to hear his heavenly voice, he informed them that he would gratify those who desired it at the gardens. But the soldiers then on guard, seconding the voice of the people, he promised to comply with their request immediately, and with all his heart. He instantly ordered his name to be entered upon the list of musicians who proposed to contend, and having thrown his lot into the urn among the rest, took his turn, and entered attended by the prefects of the praetorian cohorts bearing his harp, and followed by the military tribunes and several of his intimate friends. 
After he had taken his station and made the usual prelude, he commanded Cluvius Rufus, a man of consular rank, to proclaim in the theatre that he intended to sing the story of Niobe. This he accordingly did, and continued it until nearly ten o'clock, but deferred the disposal of the crown and the remaining part of the solemnity until the next year, that he might have more frequent opportunities of performing. But that being too long, he could not refrain from often appearing as a public performer during the interval. He made no scruple of exhibiting on the stage, even in the spectacles presented to the people by private persons, and was offered by one of the praetors no less than a million of sesterces for his services. He likewise sang tragedies in a mask, the visors of the heroes and gods, as also of the heroines and goddesses, being formed into a resemblance of his own face, and that of any woman he was in love with. Amongst the rest he sung Canache in Labour, Orestes the murderer of his mother, Oedipus blinded, and Hercules mad. In the last tragedy it is said that a young sentinel, posted at the entrance of the stage, seeing him in a prison dress and bound with fetters, as the fable of the play required, ran to his assistance. He had from his childhood an extravagant passion for horses, and his constant talk was of the Circensian races, notwithstanding it was prohibited him. Lamenting once among his fellow pupils the case of a charioteer of the Green Party, who was dragged around the circus at the tail of his chariot, and being reprimanded by his tutor for it, he pretended that he was talking of Hector. In the beginning of his reign he used to amuse himself daily with chariots drawn by four horses made of ivory upon a table. He attended at all the lesser exhibitions in the circus, at first privately, but at last openly, so that nobody ever doubted of his presence on any particular day. Nor did he conceal his desire to have the number of the prizes doubled, so that the races being increased accordingly, the diversion continued until a late hour, the leaders of parties refusing now to bring out their companies for any time less than the whole day. Upon this he took a fancy for driving the chariot himself, and that even publicly. Having made his first experiment in the gardens, amidst crowds of slaves and other rabble, he at length performed in the view of all the people in the Circus Maximus, whilst one of his freedmen dropped the napkin in the place where the magistrates used to give the signal. Not satisfied with exhibiting various specimens of his skill in those arts at Rome, he went over to Achaia, as has been already said, principally for this purpose. The several cities in which solemn trials of musical skill used to be publicly held had resolved to send him the crowns belonging to those who bore away the prize. These he accepted so graciously that he not only gave the deputies who brought them an immediate audience, but even invited them to his table. Being requested by some of them to sing at supper, and prodigiously applauded, he said, the Greeks were the only people who had an ear for music, and were the only good judges of him and his attainments. Without delay he commenced his journey, and on his arrival at Cassiope exhibited his first musical performance before the altar of Jupiter Cassius. He afterwards appeared at the celebration of all public games in Greece, for such as fell in different years he brought within the compass of one, and some he ordered to be celebrated a second time in the same year. At Olympia, likewise, contrary to custom, he appointed a public performance in music, and that he might meet with no interruption in this employment, when he was informed by his freedman Helius that affairs at Rome required his presence, he wrote to him in these words, Though now all your hopes and wishes are for my speedy return, yet you ought rather to advise and hope that I may come back with a character worthy of Nero. During the time of his musical performance, nobody was allowed to stir out of the theatre upon any account, however necessary, insomuch that it is said some women with child were delivered there. Many of the spectators being quite wearied with hearing and applauding him, because the town gates were shut, slipped privately over the walls, or, counterfeiting themselves dead, were carried out for their funeral. With what extreme anxiety he engaged in these contests, with what keen desire to bear away the prize, and with how much awe of the judges, is scarcely to be believed. As if his adversaries had been on a level with himself, he would watch them narrowly, defame them privately, and sometimes upon meeting them rail at them in very scurrilous language, 
or bribed them if they were better performers than himself. He always addressed the judges with the most profound reverence before he began, telling them he had done all things that were necessary by way of preparation, but that the issue of the approaching trial was in the hand of fortune, and that they, as wise and skilful men, ought to exclude from their judgment things merely accidental. Upon their encouraging him to have a good heart, he went off with more assurance, but not entirely free from anxiety, interpreting the silence and modesty of some of them into sourness and ill-nature, and saying that he was suspicious of them. In these contests he adhered so strictly to the rules, that he never durst spit, nor wipe the sweat from his forehead in any other way than with his sleeve. Having, in the performance of a tragedy, dropped his sceptre, and not quickly recovering it, he was in a great fright lest he should be set aside for the miscarriage, and could not regain his assurance until an actor who stood by swore he was certain it had not been observed in the midst of the acclamations and exultations of the people. When the prize was adjudged to him, he always proclaimed it himself, and even entered the lists with the heralds. That no memory or the least monument might remain of any other victor in the sacred Grecian games, he ordered all their statues and pictures to be pulled down, dragged away with hooks, and thrown into the common sewers. He drove the chariot with various numbers of horses, and at the Olympic Games with no fewer than ten, though in a poem of his he had reflected upon Mithridates for that innovation. Being thrown out of his chariot, he was again replaced, but could not retain his seat, and was obliged to give up before he reached the goal, but was crowned notwithstanding. On his departure he declared the whole province a free country, and conferred upon the judges in the several games the freedom of Rome with large sums of money. All these favours he proclaimed himself with his own voice from the middle of the stadium during the solemnity of the Isthmian games. On his return from Greece, arriving at Naples, because he had commenced his career as a public performer in that city, he made his entrance in a chariot drawn by white horses through a breach in the city wall, according to the practice of those who were victorious in the sacred Grecian games. In the same manner he entered Antium, Alba, and Rome. He made his entry into the city, riding in the same chariot in which Augustus had triumphed, in a purple tunic and a cloak embroidered with golden stars, having on his head the crown won at Olympia, and in his right hand that which was given him at the Parthian games, the rest being carried in a procession before him, with inscriptions denoting the places where they had been won, from whom, and in what plays or musical performances, whilst a train followed him, with loud acclamations, crying out that they were the emperor's attendants and the soldiers of his triumph. Having then caused an arch of the Circus Maximus to be taken down, he passed through the breach, as also through the Velabrum and the Forum, to the Palatine Hill and the Temple of Apollo. Everywhere as he marched along, victims were slain, while the streets were strewed with saffron, and birds, chaplets, and sweetmeats scattered abroad. He suspended the sacred crowns in his chamber about his beds, and caused statues of himself to be erected in the attire of a harper, and as his likeness stamped upon the coin in the same dress. After this period he was so far from abating anything of his application to music, that for the preservation of his voice he never addressed the soldiers but by messages, or with some person to deliver his speeches for him, when he thought fit to make his appearance amongst them. Nor did he ever do anything, either in jest or earnest, without a voice-master standing by, to caution him against overstraining his vocal organs, and to apply a handkerchief to his mouth when he did. He offered his friendship, or avowed open enmity to many, according as they were lavish or sparing in giving him their applause. Petulancy, lewdness, luxury, avarice, and cruelty he practised at first with reserve and in private, as if prompted to them only by the folly of youth, but even then the world was of opinion that they were the faults of his nature and not of his age. After it was dark he used to enter the taverns, disguised in a cap or a wig, and ramble about the streets in sport, which was not void of mischief. He used to beat those he met coming home from supper, 
and if they made any resistance, would wound them and throw them into the common sewer. He broke open and robbed shops, establishing an auction at home for selling his booty. In the scuffles which took place on those occasions, he often ran the hazard of losing his eyes and even his life, being beaten almost to death by a senator for handling his wife indecently. After this adventure, he never again ventured abroad at that time of night without some tribunes following him at a little distance. In the daytime, he would be carried to the theatre, incognito, in a litter, placing himself upon the upper part of the proscenium, where he not only witnessed the quarrels which arose on account of the performances, but also encouraged them. When they came to blows, and stones and pieces of broken benches began to fly about, he threw them plentifully amongst the people, and once even broke a praetor's head. His vices gaining strength by degrees, he laid aside his jocular amusements and all disguise, breaking out into enormous crimes without the least attempt to conceal them. His revels were prolonged from midday to midnight, while he was frequently refreshed by warm baths, and in the summer time by such as were cooled with snow. He often supped in public, in the Naumachia with the sluices shut, or in the Campus Martius, or the Circus Maximus, being waited upon at table by common prostitutes of the town, and Syrian strumpets and glee girls. As often as he went down the Tiber to Ostia, or coasted through the Gulf of Baiae, booths furnished as brothels and eating-houses were erected along the shore and river-banks, before which stood matrons who, like boards and hostesses, allured him to land. It was also his custom to invite himself to supper with his friends, at one of which was expended no less than four millions of sesterces in chaplets, and at another something more in roses. Besides the abuse of free-born lads and the debauch of married women, he committed a rape upon Rubria, a vestal virgin. He was upon the point of marrying Acte, his freedwoman, having suborned some men of consular rank to swear that she was of royal descent. He gelded the boy Sporus, and endeavoured to transform him into a woman. He even went so far as to marry him with all the usual formalities of a marriage settlement, the rose-coloured nuptial veil, and a numerous company at the wedding. When the ceremony was over, he had him conducted like a bride to his own house, and treated him as his wife. It was jocularly observed by some person that it would have been well for mankind had such a wife fallen to the lot of his father, Domitius. This Sporus he carried about with him in a litter round the solemn assemblies and fairs of Greece, and afterwards at Rome through the Sigillaria, dressed in the rich attire of an empress, kissing him from time to time as they rode together. That he entertained an incestuous passion for his mother, but was deterred by her enemies, for fear that this haughty and overbearing woman should by her compliance get him entirely into her power and govern in everything, was universally believed especially after he had introduced amongst his concubines a strumpet who was reported to have a strong resemblance to Agrippina. He prostituted his own chastity to such a degree that after he had defiled every part of his person with some unnatural pollution, he at last invented an extraordinary kind of diversion, which was to be let out of a den in the arena, covered with the skin of a wild beast, and then assail with violence the private parts both of men and women, while they were bound to stakes. After he had vented this furious passion upon them, he finished the play in the embraces of his freedman Doriphorus, to whom he was married in the same way that Sporus had been married to himself, imitating the cries and shrieks of young virgins when they are ravished. I have been informed from numerous sources that he firmly believed no man in the world to be chaste, or any part of his person undefiled, but that most men concealed that vice, and were cunning enough to keep it secret. To those, therefore, who frankly owned their unnatural lewdness, he forgave all other crimes. He thought that there was no other use of riches and money than to squander them away profusely, regarding all those as sordid wretches who kept their expenses within due bounds, and extolling those as truly noble and generous souls who lavished away and wasted all they possessed. He praised and admired his uncle Caius upon no account more than for squandering in a short time the vast treasure left him by Tiberius. 
Accordingly, he was himself extravagant and profuse, beyond all bounds. He spent upon Tiridates eight hundred thousand sesterces a day, a sum almost incredible, and at his departure presented him with upwards of a million. He likewise bestowed upon Menecrates the harper, and Spicillus a gladiator, the estates and houses of men who had received the honour of a triumph. He enriched the usurer, Cercopithecus Penerotes, with estates both in town and country, and gave him a funeral in pomp and magnificence little inferior to that of princes. He never wore the same garment twice. He has been known to stake four hundred thousand sesterces on a throw of the dice. It was his custom to fish with a golden net drawn by silken cords of purple and scarlet. It is said that he never travelled with less than a thousand baggage carts, the mules being all shod with silver, and the drivers dressed in scarlet jackets of the finest Canusian cloth, with a numerous train of footmen, and troops of mazacans with bracelets on their arms, and mounted upon horses in splendid trappings. In nothing was he more prodigal than in his buildings. He completed his palace by continuing it from the Palatine to the Esquiline Hill, calling the building at first only the Passage, but after it was burnt down and rebuilt, the Golden House. Of its dimensions and furniture it may be sufficient to say thus much. The porch was so high that there stood in it a colossal statue of himself, a hundred and twenty feet in height, and the space included in it was so ample that it had triple porticoes a mile in length, and a lake like a sea, surrounded with buildings which had the appearance of a city. Within its area were cornfields, vineyards, pastures, and woods, containing a vast number of animals of various kinds, both wild and tame. In other parts it was entirely overlaid with gold, and adorned with jewels and mother-of-pearl. The supper-rooms were vaulted, and compartments of the ceilings, inlaid with ivory, were made to revolve and scatter flowers, while they contained pipes which shed unguents upon the guests. The chief banqueting-room was circular, and revolved perpetually, night and day, in imitation of the motion of the celestial bodies. The baths were supplied with water from the sea and the albula. Upon the dedication of this magnificent house after it was finished, all he said in approval of it was, that he had now a dwelling fit for a man. He commenced making a pond for the reception of all the hot streams from Baie, which he designed to have continued from Misenum to the Avernian Lake, in a conduit, enclosed in galleries, and also a canal from Avernum to Ostia, that ships might pass from one to the other without a sea voyage. The length of the proposed canal was one hundred and sixty miles, and it was intended to be of breadth sufficient to permit ships with five banks of oars to pass each other. For the execution of these designs, he ordered all prisoners in every part of the empire to be brought to Italy, and that even those who were convicted of the most heinous crimes, in lieu of any other sentence, should be condemned to work at them. He was encouraged to all this wild and enormous profusion, not only by the great revenue of the empire, but by the sudden hopes given him of an immense hidden treasure, which Queen Dido, upon her flight from Tyre, had brought with her to Africa. This, a Roman knight pretended to assure him on good grounds, was still hid there in some deep caverns, and might with a little labour be recovered. End of Nero Part 2《Nero》Part Three of *The Lives of the Twelve Caesars* by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. *The Lives of the Twelve Caesars* by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. *Nero* Part Three, Paragraphs Thirty-Two to Forty. But being disappointed in his expectations of this resource, and reduced to such difficulties for want of money, that he was obliged to defer paying his troops, and the rewards due to the veterans, he resolved upon supplying his necessities by means of false accusations and plunder. 
In the first place he ordered that if any freedman, without sufficient reason, bore the name of the family to which he belonged, the half, instead of three-fourths of his estate, should be brought into the exchequer at his decease, also that the estates of all such persons as had not in their wills been mindful of their prince should be confiscated, and that the lawyers who had drawn or dictated such wills should be liable to a fine. He ordained likewise that all words and actions upon which any informer could ground a prosecution should be deemed treason. He demanded an equivalent for the crowns which the cities of Greece had at any time offered him in the solemn games. Having forbade any one to use the colours of amethyst and Tyrian purple, he privately sent a person to sell a few ounces of them upon the day of the Nundinae, and then shut up all the merchant's shops on the pretext that his edict had been violated. It is said that as he was playing and singing in the theatre, observing a married lady dressed in the purple which he had prohibited, he pointed her out to his procurators, upon which she was immediately dragged out of her seat, and not only stripped of her clothes, but her property. He never nominated a person to any office without saying to him, You know what I want, and let us take care that nobody has anything he can call his own. At last he rifled many temples of the rich offerings with which they were stored, and melted down all the gold and silver statues, and amongst them those of the Penates, which Galba afterwards restored. He began the practice of parricide and murder with Claudius himself, for although he was not the contriver of his death, he was privy to the plot. Nor did he make any secret of it, but used afterwards to commend in a Greek proverb mushrooms as food fit for the gods, because Claudius had been poisoned with them. He traduced his memory both by word and deed in the grossest manner, one while charging him with folly, another with cruelty. For he used to say by way of jest that he had ceased morari amongst men, pronouncing the first syllable long, and treated as null many of his decrees and ordinances, as made by a doting old blockhead. He enclosed the place where his body was burnt with only a low wall of rough masonry, he attempted to poison Britannicus, as much out of envy because he had a sweeter voice as from apprehension of what might ensue from the respect which the people entertained for his father's memory. He employed for this purpose a woman named Locusta, who had been a witness against some persons guilty of like practices. But the poison she gave him, working more slowly than he expected, and only causing a purge, he sent for the woman, and beat her with his own hand, charging her with administering an antidote instead of poison, and upon her alleging an excuse that she had given Britannicus but a gentle mixture in order to prevent suspicion, "'Think you,' said he, "'that I am afraid of the Julian law,' and obliged her to prepare in his own chamber and before his eyes as quick and strong a dose as possible. This he tried upon a kid, but the animal lingering for five hours before it expired, he ordered her to go to work again." and when she had done he gave the poison to a pig, which, dying immediately, he commanded the potion to be brought into the eating-room and given to Britannicus, while he was at supper with him. The prince had no sooner tasted it than he sunk on the floor, Nero, meanwhile, pretending to the guests that it was only a fit of the falling sickness, to which he said he was subject. He buried him the following day, in a mean and hurried way, during violent storms of rain. He gave Locusta a pardon, and rewarded her with a great estate in land, placing some disciples with her to be instructed in her trade. His mother, being used to make strict inquiry into what he said or did, and to reprimand him with the freedom of a parent, he was so much offended that he endeavoured to expose her to public resentment, by frequently pretending a resolution to quit the government and retire to Rhodes. Soon afterwards he deprived her of all honour and power, took from her the guard of Roman and German soldiers, banished her from the palace and from his society, and persecuted her in every way he could contrive, employing persons to harass her when at Rome with lawsuits, and to disturb her in her retirement from town with the most scurrilous and abusive language, following her about by land and sea. But being terrified with her menaces and violent spirit, he resolved upon her destruction, and thrice attempted it by poison. Finding, however, that she had previously secured herself by antidotes, he contrived machinery by which the floor over her bedchamber 
might be made to fall upon her while she was asleep in the night. This design miscarrying likewise, through the little caution used by those who were in the secret, his next stratagem was to construct a ship which could be easily shivered, in hopes of destroying her, either by drowning, or by the deck above her cabin crushing her in its fall. Accordingly, under colour of a pretended reconciliation, he wrote her an extremely affectionate letter, inviting her to Baye, to celebrate with him the festival of Minerva. He had given private orders to the captains of the galleys which were to attend her, to shatter to pieces the ship in which she had come, by falling foul of it, but in such a manner that it might appear to be done accidentally. He prolonged the entertainment for the more convenient opportunity of executing the plot in the night, and at her return from Bauli, instead of the old ship which had conveyed her to Baye, he offered that which he had contrived for her destruction. He attended her to the vessel in a very cheerful mood, and at parting with her kissed her breasts, after which he sat up very late in the night, waiting with great anxiety to learn the issue of his project. But receiving information that everything had fallen out contrary to his wish, and that she had saved herself by swimming, not knowing what course to take, upon her freedman, Lucius Agarinus, bringing word with great joy that she was safe and well, he privately dropped a poniard by him. He then commanded the freedman to be seized and put in chains, under pretense of his having been employed by his mother to assassinate him, at the same time ordering her to be put to death, and giving out that, to avoid punishment for her intended crime, she had laid violent hands upon herself. Other circumstances still more horrible are related on good authority, as that he went to view her corpse, and handling her limbs pointed out some blemishes, and commended other points, and that growing thirsty during the survey he called for drink. Yet he was never afterwards able to bear the stings of his own conscience for this atrocious act, although encouraged by the congratulatory addresses of the army, the senate, and people. He frequently affirmed that he was haunted by his mother's ghost, and persecuted with the whips and burning torches of the Furies. Nay, he attempted by magical rites to bring up her ghost from below and soften her rage against him. When he was in Greece, he durst not attend the celebration of the Eleusinian Mysteries, at the initiation of which impious and wicked persons are warned by the voice of the herald from approaching the rites. Besides the murder of his mother, he had been guilty of that of his aunt, for being obliged to keep her bed in consequence of a complaint in her bowels, he paid her a visit, and she, being then advanced in years, stroking his downy chin in the tenderness of affection, said to him, "'May I but live to see the day when this is shaved for the first time, and I shall then die contented.' He turned, however, to those about him, made a jest of it, saying that he would have his beard immediately taken off, and ordered the physicians to give her more violent purgatives. He seized upon her estate before she had expired, suppressing her will, that he might enjoy the whole himself. He had besides Octavia two other wives, Poppaea Sabina, whose father had borne the office of Quaestor, and who had been married before to a Roman knight, and after her Statilia Messalina, great-granddaughter of Taurus, who was twice consul, and received the honour of a triumph. To obtain possession of her, he put to death her husband, Atticus Vestinus, who was then consul. He soon became disgusted with Octavia, and ceased from having any intercourse with her, and being censured by his friends for it, he replied, "'She ought to be satisfied with having the rank and appendages of his wife.' Soon afterwards he made several attempts, but in vain, to strangle her, and then divorced her for barrenness. But the people disapproving of the divorce, and making severe comments upon it, he also banished her. At last he put her to death upon a charge of adultery so impudent and false, that when all those who were put to the torture positively denied their knowledge of it, he suborned his pedagogue, Anicetus, to affirm that he had secretly intrigued with and debauched her. He married Poppaea twelve days after the divorce of Octavia, and entertained a great affection for her, but nevertheless killed her with a kick which he gave her when she was big with child and in bad health, only because she found fault with him for returning late from driving his chariot. He had by her a daughter, Claudia Augusta, who died an infant. There was no person at all connected with him who escaped his deadly and unjust cruelty. 
under pretense of her being engaged in a plot against him, he put to death Antonia, Claudius's daughter, who refused to marry him after the death of Poppaea. In the same way he destroyed all who were allied to him either by blood or marriage, amongst whom was young Aulus Plautinus. He first compelled him to submit to his unnatural lust, and then ordered him to be executed, crying out, Let my mother bestow her kisses on my successor thus defiled, pretending that he had been his mother's paramour, and by her encouraged to aspire to the empire. His stepson Rufinus Crispinus, Poppaea's son, though a minor, he ordered to be drowned in the sea, while he was fishing by his own slaves, because he was reported to act frequently amongst his playfellows the part of a general or an emperor. He banished Tuscus, his nurse's son, for presuming, when he was procurator of Egypt, to wash in the baths which had been constructed in expectation of his own coming. Seneca, his preceptor, he forced to kill himself, though upon his desiring leave to retire, and offering to surrender his estate, he solemnly swore that there was no foundation for his suspicions, and that he would perish himself sooner than hurt him. Having promised Burrus, the Praetorian prefect, a remedy for a swelling in his throat, he sent him poison. Some old rich freedmen of Claudius, who had formerly not only promoted his adoption, but were also instrumental to his advancement to the empire, and had been his governors, he took off by poison, given them in their meat or drink. Nor did he proceed with less cruelty against those who were not of his family. A blazing star, which is vulgarly supposed to portend destruction to kings and princes, appeared above the horizon several nights successively. He felt great anxiety on account of this phenomenon, and being informed by one Babylus, an astrologer, that princes were used to expiate such omens by the sacrifice of illustrious persons, and so avert the danger foreboded to their own persons, by bringing it on the heads of their chief men, he resolved on the destruction of the principal nobility in Rome. He was the more encouraged to do this, because he had some plausible pretense for carrying it into execution, from the discovery of two conspiracies against him, the former and more dangerous of which was that formed by Piso, and discovered at Rome, the other was that of Vinicius at Beneventum. The conspirators were brought to their trials, loaded with triple fetters. Some ingenuously confessed the charge, others avowed that they thought the design against his life an act of favour for which he was obliged to them, as it was impossible in any other way than by death to relieve a person rendered infamous by crimes of the greatest enormity. The children of those who had been condemned were banished the city, and afterwards either poisoned or starved to death. It is asserted that some of them, with their tutors, and the slaves who carried their satchels, were all poisoned together at one dinner, and others not suffered to seek their daily bread. From this period he butchered, without distinction or quarter, all whom his caprice suggested as objects for his cruelty, and upon the most frivolous pretenses. To mention only a few. Salvidianus or Fetus was accused of letting out three taverns attached to his house in the Forum to some cities for the use of their deputies at Rome. The charge against Cassius Longinus, a lawyer who had lost his sight, was that he kept amongst the busts of his ancestors that of Caius Cassius, who was concerned in the death of Julius Caesar. The only charge objected against Paetus Thrasea was that he had a melancholy cast of features and looked like a schoolmaster. He allowed but one hour to those whom he obliged to kill themselves, and to prevent delay he sent them physicians, to cure them immediately if they lingered beyond that time, for so he called bleeding them to death. There was at that time an Egyptian of a most voracious appetite, who would digest raw flesh or anything else that was given him. It was credibly reported that the emperor was extremely desirous of furnishing him with living men to tear and devour. Being elated with his great success in the perpetration of crimes, he declared that no prince before himself ever knew the extent of his power. He threw out strong intimations that he would not even spare the senators who survived, but would entirely extirpate that order, and put the provinces and armies into the hands of the Roman knights and his own freedmen. It is certain that he never gave or vouchsafed to allow anyone the customary kiss, either on entering or departing, 
or even returned a salute. And at the inauguration of a work, the cut through the isthmus, he, with a loud voice amidst the assembled multitude, uttered a prayer that the undertaking might prove fortunate for himself and the Roman people, without taking the smallest notice of the Senate. He spared, moreover, neither the people of Rome nor the capital of his country. Somebody in conversation saying, Emu tanontos gaia micteto puri, when I am dead let fire devour the world. Nay, said he, let it be while I am living, emus dontos. And he acted accordingly, for, pretending to be disgusted with the old buildings and the narrow and winding streets, he set the city on fire so openly that many of consular rank caught his own household servants on their property, with tow and torches in their hands, but durst not meddle with them. There being near his golden house some granaries, the sight of which he exceedingly coveted, they were battered as if with machines of war, and set on fire, the walls being built of stone. During six days and seven nights this terrible devastation continued, the people being obliged to fly to the tombs and monuments for lodging and shelter. Meanwhile a vast number of stately buildings, the houses of generals celebrated in former times, and even then still decorated with the spoils of war, were laid in ashes, as well as the temples of the gods, which had been vowed and dedicated by the kings of Rome, and afterwards in the Punic and Gallic wars. In short, everything that was remarkable and worthy to be seen which time had spared. This fire he beheld from a tower in the house of Mechinus, and, being greatly delighted, as he said, with the beautiful effects of the conflagration, he sung a poem to the ruin of Troy in the tragic dress he used on the stage. To turn this calamity to his own advantage by plunder and rapine, he promised to remove the bodies of those who had perished in the fire and clear the rubbish at his own expense, suffering no one to meddle with the remains of their property but he not only received but exacted contributions on account of the loss, until he had exhausted the means both of the provinces and private persons. To these terrible and shameful calamities brought upon the people by their prince were added some proceeding from misfortune. Such were a pestilence, by which within the space of one autumn there died no less than thirty thousand persons, as appeared from the registers in the temple of Libitina, a great disaster in Britain, where two of the principal towns belonging to the Romans were plundered, and a dreadful havoc made both amongst our troops and allies, a shameful discomfiture of the army of the East, where in Armenia the legions were obliged to pass under the yoke, and it was with great difficulty that Syria was retained. Amidst all these disasters it was strange, and indeed particularly remarkable, that he bore nothing more patiently than the scurrilous language and railing abuse which was in every one's mouth, treating no class of persons with more gentleness than those who assailed him with invective and lampoons. Many things of that kind were posted up about the city, or otherwise published, both in Greek and Latin, such as these. Neron, Orestes, Alcmaion, Metroctonoi. Neonymphon Neron, Idian meter apectenin. Orestes and Alcmaeon, Nero too, the lustful Nero, worst of all the crew, fresh from his bridal, their own mothers slew. Quis neget aeneae magna de stirpe Neronem, sustulit hic matrem, sustulit ille patrem. Sprung from Aeneas, pious, wise, and great, who says that Nero is degenerate? Safe through the flames one bore his sire, the other, to save himself, took off his loving mother. Dum tendit citaram noster, dum cornua partus, noster erit paean, ille hecate belletes. His lyre to harmony our Nero strings, his arrows o'er the plain the Parthian wings, ours call the tuneful paean famed in war, the other Phoebus name, the god who shoots afar. Roma domus fiet, veos migrate quidites, sinon et veos occupat ista domus. All Rome will be one house, to vei fly, should it not stretch to vei by and by. 
but he neither made any inquiry after the authors, nor when information was laid before the Senate against some of them would he allow a severe sentence to be passed. Isidorus, the cynic philosopher, said to him aloud as he was passing along the streets, You sing the misfortunes of Nauplius well, but behave badly yourself. And Datus, a comic actor, when repeating these words in the piece, Farewell, father, farewell, mother, mimicked the gestures of persons drinking and swimming, significantly alluding to the deaths of Claudius and Agrippina, and on uttering the last clause, Orcus vobis ducit pedes, you stand this moment on the brink of Orcus, he plainly intimated his application of it to the precarious position of the Senate. Yet Nero only banished the player and philosopher from the city and Italy, either because he was insensible to shame, or from apprehension that if he discovered his vexation, still keener things might be said of him. The world, after tolerating such an emperor for little less than fourteen years, at length forsook him. The Gauls, headed by Julius Vindex, who at that time governed the province as Propraetor, being the first to revolt. Nero had been formally told by astrologers that it would be his fortune to be at last deserted by all the world, and this occasioned that celebrated saying of his, an artist can live in any country, by which he meant to offer as an excuse for his practice of music, that it was not only his amusement as a prince, but might be his support when reduced to a private station. Yet some of the astrologers promised him in his forlorn state the rule of the East, and some in express words the kingdom of Jerusalem. But the greater part of them flattered him with assurances of his being restored to his former fortune, and being most inclined to believe the latter prediction, upon losing Britain and Armenia, he imagined he had run through all the misfortunes which the fates had decreed him. But when, upon consulting the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, he was advised to beware of the seventy-third year, as if he were not to die till then, never thinking of Galba's age, he conceived such hopes not only of living to advanced years, but of constant and singular good fortune, that having lost some things of great value by shipwreck, he scrupled not to say amongst his friends that the fishes would bring them back to him. At Naples he heard of the insurrection in Gaul, on the anniversary of the day on which he killed his mother, and bore it with so much unconcern as to excite a suspicion that he was really glad of it, since he had now a fair opportunity of plundering those wealthy provinces by the right of war. Immediately going to the gymnasium, he witnessed the exercise of the wrestlers with the greatest delight. Being interrupted at supper with letters which brought yet worse news, he expressed no greater resentment than only to threaten the rebels. For eight days together he never attempted to answer any letters nor give any orders, but buried the whole affair in profound silence. End of Nero, Part 3《Nero》Part 4 of The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. — Nero — Part 4. Paragraphs 41 to 57. Being roused at last by numerous proclamations of Vindex, treating him with reproaches and contempt, he, in a letter to the Senate, exhorted them to avenge his wrongs and those of the Republic, desiring them to excuse his not appearing in the Senate House, because he had got cold. But nothing so much galled him as to find himself railed at as a pitiful harper, and, instead of Nero, styled Aenobarbus, which being his family name, since he was upbraided with it, he declared that he would resume it and lay aside the name he had taken by adoption. Passing by the other accusations as wholly groundless, he earnestly refuted that of his want of skill in an art upon which he had bestowed so much pains, and in which he had arrived at such perfection, asking frequently those about him if they knew any one who was a more accomplished musician but being alarmed by messengers after messengers of ill news from Gaul, he returned in great consternation to Rome. 
On the road his mind was somewhat relieved by observing the frivolous omen of a Gaulish soldier defeated and dragged by the hair by a Roman knight, which was sculptured on a monument, so that he leapt for joy and adored the heavens. Even then he made no appeal either to the Senate or people, but calling together some of the leading men at his own house he held a hasty consultation upon the present state of affairs, and then, during the remainder of the day, carried them about with him to view some musical instruments of a new invention, which were played by water, exhibiting all the parts and discoursing upon the principles and difficulties of the contrivance, which, he told them, he intended to produce in the theatre, if Vindex would give him leave. Soon afterwards he received intelligence that Galba and the Spaniards had declared against him, upon which he fainted, and losing his reason lay a long time speechless, apparently dead. As soon as recovered from this state of stupefaction, he tore his clothes, beat his head, crying out, "'It is all over with me!' His nurse, endeavouring to comfort him, and telling him that the like things had happened to other princes before him, he replied, "'I am beyond all example wretched, for I have lost an empire whilst I am still living.' He nevertheless abated nothing of his luxury and inattention to business." Nay, on the arrival of good news from the provinces, he, at a sumptuous entertainment, sung with an air of merriment some jovial verses upon the leaders of the revolt, which were made public, and accompanied them with suitable gestures. Being carried privately to the theatre, he sent word to an actor who was applauded by the spectators, that he had it all his own way, now that he himself did not appear on the stage." At the first breaking out of these troubles, it is believed that he had formed many designs of a monstrous nature, although conformable enough to his natural disposition. These were to send new governors and commanders to the provinces and the armies, and employ assassins to butcher all the former governors and commanders, as men unanimously engaged in a conspiracy against him, to massacre the exiles in every quarter, and all the Gaulish population in Rome, the former lest they should join the insurrection, the latter as privy to the designs of their countrymen and ready to support them, to abandon Gaul itself, to be wasted and plundered by his armies, to poison the whole senate at a feast, to fire the city and then let loose the wild beasts upon the people, in order to impede their stopping the progress of the flames. But being deterred from the execution of these designs, not so much by remorse of conscience as by despair of being able to effect them, and judging an expedition into Gaul necessary, he removed the consuls from their office before the time of its expiration was arrived, and in their room assumed the consulship himself, without a colleague, as if the fates had decreed that Gaul should not be conquered but by a consul. Upon assuming the Fasces, after an entertainment at the palace, as he walked out of the room leaning on the arms of some of his friends, he declared that as soon as he arrived in the province he would make his appearance amongst the troops, unarmed, and do nothing but weep and that after he had brought the mutineers to repentance, he would the next day, in the public rejoicings, sing songs of triumph, which he must now, without loss of time, apply himself to compose. In preparing for this expedition, his first care was to provide carriages for his musical instruments, and machinery to be used upon the stage, to have the hair of the concubines he carried with him dressed in the fashion of men, and to supply them with battle-axes and Amazonian bucklers. He summoned the city tribes to enlist, but no qualified persons appearing, he ordered all masters to send a certain number of slaves, the best they had, not excepting their stewards and secretaries. He commanded the several orders of the people to bring in a fixed proportion of their estates, as they stood in the censor's books, all tenants of houses and mansions to pay one year's rent forthwith into the exchequer, and with unheard-of strictness, would receive only new coin of the purest silver and the finest gold, insomuch that most people refused to pay, crying out unanimously that he ought to squeeze the informers, and oblige them to surrender their gains. The general odium in which he was held received an increase by the great scarcity of corn, and an occurrence connected with it. For, as it happened just at that time, there arrived from Alexandria a ship which was said to be freighted with dust for the wrestlers belonging to the emperor. This so much inflamed the public rage that he was treated with the utmost abuse and scurrility. Upon the top of one of his statues was placed the figure of a chariot, with a Greek inscription, that, now indeed he had a race to run, let him be gone. 
A little bag was tied about another with a ticket containing these words. What could I do? Truly thou hast merited the sack. Some person likewise wrote on the pillars in the forum that he had even woke the cocks with his singing, and many in the night-time, pretending to find fault with their servants, frequently called for a vindex. He was also terrified with manifest warnings, both old and new, arising from dreams, auspices, and omens. He had never been used to dream before the murder of his mother. After that event he fancied in his sleep that he was steering a ship, and that the rudder was forced from him, that he was dragged by his wife Octavia into a prodigiously dark place, and was at one time covered over with a vast swarm of winged ants, and at another surrounded by the national images which were set up near Pompey's theatre, and hindered from advancing farther, that a Spanish genet he was fond of had his hinder parts so changed as to resemble those of an ape, and having his head only left unaltered, neighed very harmoniously. The doors of the mausoleum of Augustus flying open of themselves, there issued from it a voice calling on him by name. The lares, being adorned with fresh garlands on the calends, the first of January, fell down during the preparations for sacrificing to them. While he was taking the omens, Sporus presented him with a ring, the stone of which had carved upon it the rape of Proserpine. When a great multitude of the several orders was assembled to attend at the solemnity of making vows to the gods, it was a long time before the keys of the capital could be found. And when, in a speech of his to the Senate against Vindex, these words were read, that the miscreants should be punished and soon make the end they merited, they all cried out, You will do it, Augustus. It was likewise remarked that the last tragic piece which he sung was Oedipus in exile, and that he fell as he was repeating this verse, Tanen manorge singamos meter pater, Wife, mother, father, force me to my end. Meanwhile, on the arrival of the news that the rest of the armies had declared against him, he tore to pieces the letters which were delivered to him at dinner, overthrew the table, and dashed with violence against the ground two favourite cups, which he called Homer's, because some of that poet's verses were cut upon them. Then, taking from Locusta a dose of poison which he put up in a golden box, he went into the civilian gardens, and thence dispatching a trusty freedman to Ostia with orders to make ready a fleet, he endeavoured to prevail with some tribunes and centurions of the Praetorian guards to attend him in his flight, but part of them showing no great inclination to comply, others absolutely refusing, and one of them crying out aloud, Us gradione mori miserum est. Say, is it then so sad a thing to die? He was in great perplexity whether he should submit himself to Galba, or apply to the Parthians for protection, or else appear before the people dressed in mourning, and upon the rostra in the most piteous manner beg pardon for his past misdemeanours, and, if he could not prevail, request of them to grant him at least the government of Egypt. A speech to this purpose was afterwards found in his writing-case but it is conjectured that he durst not venture upon this project for fear of being torn to pieces before he could get to the forum. Deferring, therefore, his resolution until the next day, he awoke about midnight, and finding the guards withdrawn, he leapt out of bed and sent round for his friends. But none of them vouchsafing any message in reply, he went with a few attendants to their houses. The doors being everywhere shut and no one giving him any answer, he returned to his bedchamber, whence those who had the charge of it had all now eloped, some having gone one way and some another, carrying off with them his bedding and box of poison. He then endeavoured to find Spiculus, the gladiator, or some one to kill him, but not being able to procure any one. What, said he, have I then neither friend nor foe? And immediately ran out as if he would throw himself into the Tiber. But this furious impulse subsiding, he wished for some place of privacy where he might collect his thoughts, and his freedman Phaon offering him his country house between the Salarian and Nomenton roads about four miles from the city, he mounted a horse, barefoot as he was and in his tunic, only slipping over it an old soiled cloak, with his head muffled up and a handkerchief before his face, and four persons only to attend him, of whom Sporus was one. He was suddenly struck with horror by an earthquake and by a flash of lightning which darted full in his face, 
and heard from the neighbouring camp the shouts of the soldiers wishing his destruction and prosperity to Galba. He also heard a traveller they met on the road say, They are in pursuit of Nero, and another ask, Is there any news in the city about Nero? Uncovering his face when his horse was started by the scent of a carcass which lay in the road, he was recognised, and saluted by an old soldier who had been discharged from the guards. When they came to the lane which turned up to the house, they quitted their horses, and with much difficulty he wound among bushes and briars, and along a track through a bed of rushes, over which they spread their cloaks for him to walk on. Having reached a wall at the back of the villa, Theon advised him to hide himself a while in a sand-pit, when he replied, I will not go underground alive. Staying there some little time while preparations were made for bringing him privately into the villa, he took up some water out of a neighbouring tank in his hand to drink, saying, This is Nero's distilled water. Then, his cloak having been torn by the brambles, he pulled out the thorns which stuck in it. At last, being admitted, creeping upon his hands and knees through a hole made for him in the wall, he lay down in the first closet he came to, upon a miserable pallet with an old coverlet thrown over it, and, being both hungry and thirsty, though he refused some coarse bread that was brought him, he drank a little warm water. All who surrounded him, now pressing him to save himself from the indignities which were ready to befall him, he ordered a pit to be sunk before his eyes, of the size of his body, and the bottom to be covered with pieces of marble put together, if any could be found about the house, and water and wood to be got ready for immediate use about his corpse, weeping at everything that was done, and frequently saying, What an artist is now about to perish! Meanwhile letters being brought in by a servant belonging to Phaon, he snatched them out of his hand, and there read, that he had been declared an enemy by the Senate, and that search was making for him, that he might be punished according to the ancient custom of the Romans. He then inquired what kind of punishment that was, and being told that the practice was to strip the criminal naked and scourge him to death, while his neck was fastened within a forked stake, he was so terrified that he took up two daggers which he had brought with him, and after feeling the points of both, put them up again, saying, the fatal hour is not yet come. One while he begged of Sporus to wail and lament, another while he entreated that one of them would set an example by killing himself, and then again he condemned his own want of resolution in these words, I yet live to my shame and disgrace. This is not becoming for Nero. It is not becoming. Thou oughtest in such circumstances to have a good heart. Come then, courage, man. The horsemen, who had received orders to bring him away alive, were now approaching the house. As soon as he heard them coming, he uttered with a trembling voice the following verse, Hippon, mo cupodon, ampictipos o atabale. The noise of swift-heeled steeds assails my ears. He drove a dagger into his throat, being assisted in the act by Epaphroditus, his secretary, a centurion bursting in just as he was half dead, and applying his cloak to the wound, pretending that he was come to his assistance, he made no other reply but this, "'Tis too late, and is this your loyalty?" Immediately after pronouncing these words he expired, with his eyes fixed and starting out of his head to the terror of all who beheld him. He had requested of his attendants, as the most essential favour, that they would let no one have his head, but that by all means his body might be burnt entire. And this Icalus, Galba's freedman, granted. He had but a little before been discharged from the prison into which he had been thrown, when the disturbances first broke out. The expenses of his funeral amounted to two hundred thousand sesterces, the bed upon which his body was carried to the pile and burnt being covered with the white robes interwoven with gold which he had worn upon the calends of January preceding. His nurses, Eclogae and Alexandra, with his concubine Acte, deposited his remains in the tomb belonging to the family of the Domitii, which stands upon the top of the hill of the gardens, and is to be seen from the Campus Martius. In that monument, a coffin of porphyry, with an altar of marble of Luna over it, is enclosed by a wall built of stone brought from Thassos. 
In stature he was a little below the common height. His skin was foul and spotted, his hair inclined to yellow, his features were agreeable rather than handsome, his eyes grey and dull, his neck was thick, his belly prominent, his legs very slender, his constitution sound. For though excessively luxurious in his mode of living, he had in the course of fourteen years only three fits of sickness, which were so slight that he neither forbore the use of wine, nor made any alteration in his usual diet. In his dress and the care of his person he was so careless that he had his hair cut in rings one above another, and when in a kaya he let it grow long behind, and he generally appeared in public in the loose dress which he used at table, with a handkerchief about his neck and without either a girdle or shoes. He was instructed when a boy in the rudiments of almost all the liberal sciences, but his mother diverted him from the study of philosophy as unsuited to one destined to be an emperor, and his preceptor, Seneca, discouraged him from reading the ancient orators, that he might longer secure his devotion to himself. Therefore, having a turn for poetry, he composed verses, both with pleasure and ease, nor did he, as some think, publish those of other writers as his own. Several little pocket-books and loose sheets have come into my possession which contain some well-known verses in his own hand, and written in such a manner that it was very evident, from the blotting and interlining, that they had not been transcribed from a copy, nor dictated by another, but were written by the composer of them. He had likewise great taste for drawing and painting, as well as for moulding statues in plaster. But above all things he most eagerly coveted popularity, being the rival of every man who obtained the applause of the people for anything he did. It was the general belief that after the crowns he won by his performances on the stage, he would the next lustrum have taken his place among the wrestlers at the Olympic Games, for he was continually practising that art, nor did he witness the gymnastic games in any part of Greece otherwise than sitting upon the ground in the stadium, as the umpires do. And if a pair of wrestlers happened to break the bounds, he would with his own hands drag them back into the centre of the circle. Because he was thought to equal Apollo in music and the sun in chariot driving, he resolved also to imitate the achievements of Hercules. And they say that a lion was got ready for him to kill, either with a club or with a close hug, in view of the people in the amphitheatre, which he was to perform naked. Towards the end of his life he publicly vowed that if his power in the state was securely re-established, he would, in the spectacles which he intended to exhibit in honour of his success, include a performance upon organs, as well as upon flutes and bagpipes, and on the last day of the games would act in the play, and take the part of Turnus, as we find it in Virgil. And there are some who say that he put to death the player Paris, as a dangerous rival. He had an insatiable desire to immortalise his name, and acquire a reputation which should last through all succeeding ages, but it was capriciously directed. He therefore took from several things and places their former appellations, and gave them new names, derived from his own. He called the month of April Neroneus, and designed changing the name of Rome into that of Neropolis. He held all religious rites in contempt, except those of the Syrian goddess, but at last he paid her so little reverence that he made water upon her, being now engaged in another superstition, in which only he obstinately persisted. For having received from some obscure plebeian a little image of a girl, as a preservative against plots, and discovered a conspiracy immediately after, he constantly worshipped his imaginary protectress as the greatest amongst the gods, offering to her three sacrifices daily. He was also desirous to have it supposed that he had, by revelations from this deity, a knowledge of future events. A few months before he died, he attended a sacrifice according to the Etruscan rites, but the omens were not favourable. He died in the thirty-second year of his age, upon the same day on which he had formerly put Octavia to death and the public joy was so great upon the occasion that the common people ran about the city with caps upon their heads. Some, however, were not wanting, who for a long time decked his tomb with spring and summer flowers. Sometimes they placed his image upon the rostra, dressed in robes of state, at another they published proclamations in his name as if he were still alive, and would shortly return to Rome and take vengeance on all his enemies. 
Vologesus, king of the Parthians, when he sent ambassadors to the Senate to renew his alliance with the Roman people, earnestly requested that due honour should be paid to the memory of Nero, and to conclude when twenty years afterwards, at which time I was a young man, some person of obscure birth gave himself out for Nero, that name secured him so favourable a reception from the Parthians that he was very zealously supported, and it was with much difficulty that they were prevailed upon to give him up. End of Nero